who are very much pros at that and in somewhat different ways too. And so they're going to talk uh, to you, Emma Ackerman, host editor, is going to be moderating this. Uh, this is the first um, event where we're bringing professionals to campus and part of what we're calling post sessions. There will be more of these throughout the year and there are also post sessions uh, led by post editors and reporters um, that are going to be set up throughout the year. Watch for the Debbie DePeel uh, emails on those. Uh, and this is, I just also want to mention, day one of uh, two things. Tomorrow we're doing critique sessions where many of you in this room will be, uh, have your work critiqued by these two, as well as other editors uh, from the Columbus Dispatch, um, from the Associated Press, um, from the Akron Beacon Journal, and obviously the, the Free Press and Slate. Um, I just want to say thanks to the J School and SAC for the funding for this. Uh, also, Justice Hill for his help in organizing this. Get a website. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, with that, we'll, we'll get into this. But uh, please, one more hand for these guys. Hi, everyone. Uh, Will pretty much said it all. But just to start off, um, Jim and Rachel, really like if you kind of just give an overview of your careers in journalism and why you got into journalism in particular. Um, wow. I decided when I was a teenager, I can't remember why, that I wanted to be a sports writer. So I was just, I was always a tomboy, I was never a cheerleader or dance, I wasn't very coordinated, so I was, I really wanted to be a sports writer. Um, I always dreamed that I would write for Sports Illustrated, and that didn't work out, but, um, you know, it's, I can't remember why, I just, that's what I wanted to do. And, um, so I did start out as a, my career as a sports writer. I worked at a small keeper in Worcester, Ohio. Um, I worked for Justice in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, I worked at um, some papers, in, or I worked at Seattle Times for a little bit, and then um, in 1999, I got to make the jump to online, and I really never looked back. I worked at NBA.com and NFL.com, and then um, when that proved to not be a very good business model to be having a 20 somethings working in overpriced office buildings downtown without a business plan. Um, I was laid off for a while and then I've been at Slate since 2002. And what do you do for Slate? Um, well, I started as a copy editor, then I was a managing editor, and um, now I'm a senior editor. Um, I do a lot of special projects that we try to um, we come up with projects that we really want to do and really care about and then we kind of try to take them and see if they appeal to sponsors who would want to, um, you know, have their brand account, editorial content, not sponsored. Content. That's a whole other thing. So, um, and you're yeah. a former associate, and I'm a former associate. I was the sports mm -hmm. editor in 1994, 95. Mm -hmm. Awesome, very cool. Um, first, I should say that it's good for me to be back to OU and to Athens. My uh, father is a graduate. Good Bobcat. Uh, my older sister was an undergrad here. Um, my experience, uh, every time I come back here, it reminds me of it, um, an ill-advised trip in high school uh, down here for Halloween, <laughs> uh, where my buddies and I got jumped in an alley by guys dressed as gladiators. <laughs> True story. One of my friends got hit over the head with an empty beer bottle and I uh, had to go get some stitches. Uh, <laughs> So it's been that crazy here for that long. <laughs> um, so I got into journalism probably from a high school teacher. Uh, she thought I was decent in English, um, not so decent in other classes. And uh, she said, hey, uh, the Catholic Times is looking for a high school editor. And this is a uh, weekly newspaper that was put out by the, Arch or the Diocese of Columbus. I grew up in Columbus. Um, and I said, sure, I'll do it. And I ended up doing it for two years, and uh, it was supposed to be a current events type column where I was writing about what was going on in all the Catholic high schools in our league. I did that for about two months, and then I decided I was just going to make it an opinion column, and nobody stopped me, so I, uh, <laughs> I did that, and I really enjoyed it. But when I got into college, I thought I went to Ohio State. Um, I thought I was going to be a psychology major until I started identifying traits that were troublesome in my friends and myself uh, through the education I was getting in psychology and I said I'm not doing this <laughs> um, and I went and started working for the Lantern at Ohio State and uh, if you guys are involved with the post that's probably the best thing you can do for your career right now because I can't tell you how valuable my college experience was working at the newspaper in fact I 
stretched my undergrad career into six years, partly because I was uh, at the newspaper and all these different editor positions and columnist, and I just loved it because we had control of this huge machine that we could do anything with. Um, and then I got a job as a copy editor right out of college at the Free Press because I had had an internship <laughs> at the Free Press, Dow Jones Editing Internship. Um, I wanted to be a reporter, and I thought I can get in the door as a copy editor. It was easier to get hired back then as a copy editor. And I just switched to reporting after that. And I've, uh, I've been at the Free Press two separate stints. There was a big strike in 1995. My paper is a unionized paper, and we all walked out. I didn't walk back in for five years. And in the meantime, I worked in television uh, at the ABC affiliate in Detroit, and I worked for the Toledo Blade for a short period of time, and I worked for a private investigator for a short period of time. And I've, I went back in 2000, and I've been a reporter there ever since. Awesome. Well, Jim, um, my first question for you, and I guess you could have seen this one coming, is uh, you were a part of a two-man investigative team that exposed the wrongdoings of then Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick. Um, could you explain a little bit about how you got started on that project and <laughs> a lot of the heartbreak involved in it? I'll try to keep it short because uh, <laughs> I could go on forever about that guy. Um, well, I was a projects reporter and the, my partner, a guy named Mike Elric, was the beat writer for the mayor. And uh, Kwame Kilpatrick got elected in 2002. He was the youngest mayor, uh, youngest person ever elected mayor in Detroit, age 31. Uh, very charismatic guy, all, had all the hope in the world. People thought he would save the city. My newspaper endorsed him. He got every chance there was to uh, be a great mayor. But he started doing silly things, and Mike and I got paired up to start investigating them. And the story that won the Pulitzer wasn't, an, it, it followed six years of stories that we had done on him and how he was, you know, using city money for tax uh, to, to fund his uh, trips out of state and overseas and staying at the best hotels you could po possibly stay at and every trip to a hotel seemed to involve also a $500 spa visit um, and he would rent limousines for four days and keep the driver the entire time that kind of stuff um, and so we did stories like that and then uh, dozens of investigative stories on him. But then the big one was, I got a hold of his text messages in uh, late 2007, early 2008, and uh, we did a story that ended up putting him in jail. Um, and uh, all those other stories that we thought no one had paid attention to over the years, it turns out that the federal government, the FBI, was investigating him just following up on every story that we did and some other things that they found on their own and they indicted him. The thing we wrote about in 2008 got him sent to jail for 120 days. No big deal, right? Two felonies. Um, and he had to resign his office. Um, but then the FBI came in and indicted him with 28 major felonies in 2010. And now he's in prison for 28 years, which is the tied for the worst or most severe public corruption sentence in U.S. history with a guy from uh, Cuyahoga County, I believe, who stole some money as a county commissioner. You want to have to wrote the Kwame Sutra, is that? The Kwame Sutra, I should have bought some, brought some of those. I got a whole trunk full. <laughs> yeah. I didn't bring them, though. <laughs> I love those. Definitely. Kwame Sutra is a little book that's, um, Mayor Kilpatrick was a very likable guy, very quotable guy, and he said some amazing things over the years, both good and bad. And so this book we put together which our editors weren't too happy about. Um, <laughs> it's called the Kwame Sutra, and uh, you can probably still find it online somewhere. <laughs> but I'm not part of it anymore. My partner bought me out. <laughs> and Rachel, you're a part of one of the most digital, digital first newsrooms. Uh, Slate, the online news magazine, has been around since 1996, so it was really doing it kind of before anybody else was. Um, <coughs> How does that impact Slate's reporting, its writing? I mean, you're not working directly out of the newsroom. Um, oh, just you mean in terms of being online? Yeah. Um, that has changed a lot. Like, I've been at Slate for 12 years, and it's <coughs> amazing, like, how fast the news cycle has gotten. Um, I still remember one of our one of our less proud moments was um, during the 2004 election. So we would change our homepage once a day. Um, and for a long time, like we would keep like a whole like week of archived homepages, like up. we could go back and look at Monday's homepage on like Thursday. 
Um, and the, the night of the 2004 election, we um, put up a, 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 a cover story after the exit polls, and it said, look who's winning, and it said John Kerry smiling. And that cover stayed up until like two o'clock in the morning, when they, we didn't have any, we didn't have a news blog at the time. We didn't have anybody. Like we were waiting for the final results to come in to to write our story saying who won. And so yeah, we got made fun of. Um, <coughs> now you know, back then we, we didn't have an editor. You know, we have now we have somebody whose whole job is to read the slate, read, read the site, be aware of what's coming in, knowing when it goes live, and getting it printed <coughs> as fast as we can. Um, when I started, we probably had two or three political writers. Now, um, I'd say we have like closer to six to eight. Um, we have a, a news blogger. Like a, well, Our news blog is actually, it, it takes a whole team of people to do it now. Um, we have a culture blog. Um, we, when I started, we published Probably, when I was a copy editor, I for sure, we published maybe eight to ten stories a day. Um, a typical day now has between 50 and 60, if you count blog posts and articles um, and podcasts. <coughs> so um, it's been it, it's been amazing to watch because when I started, we didn't have to worry about YouTube. Um, we didn't really have to worry about Facebook. Um, Twitter wasn't a thing, um, and even when Twitter started, it was yeah, you know, it, it wasn't immediately a source for like news and like people would go to people they were eating for breakfast or something um it, so we've had to evolve with all of that but so i would say that just the biggest change is is the pace you know um you can't just write we just did yeah you know, the emmys just happened and unfortunately they were boring so we didn't get great traffic but um yeah we really need like the vmas to get good traffic with like miley cyrus you know doing crazy things on stage. Um, but we probably had, instead of like writing one post, like saying this was an Emmy, we were like blogging things all night. You know, we probably had 20 pieces about the Emmys. And whenever <coughs> there was a little, like if something crazy happened, yeah, we would pull the video. You, you can do, you can take like a video of John Oliver, what he said on Sunday night, and write two paragraphs about it. And that gets like 100,000 page views. And then we have like investigative stories that people work on for like months. and we put them up for a day and they're lucky to get that kind of traffic. And so it's, you know, the, but the pace is such that you kind of have to do that. So, um, yeah, it's got to faster. So how many articles is Slate typically publishing a day? About, I'd say like articles, articles, probably 20 to 30. Um, then we'll have like 10 to 15 posts on our news blog, the culture blog will have three or four. Um, our business blog will have four to six. Um, we have a technology blog, so, um, yeah, so yeah, we we cover so much. We cover everything. We have yeah, you know, we have a science editor. It's amazing. She's great. Um, so we yeah, you know, we have technology, we have science, we have healthcare, um, politics. It's not just news and culture. So, um, but yeah, so probably twenty to thirty articles, and then the rest are blog posts. And Jim, I have a web-centric question for you as well. Um, obviously, the freak has gone through a lot of changes since you've been there, but mm -hmm. according to uh, a recent Pew poll, mm -hmm. apparently the Detroit Free Press cracked the top 10 for audience engagement for news sites in the country, um, which is really interesting for Metro Daily, um, beating out the Boston Globe, the Dallas Morning News. How has the freak changed since you've been there, and how has it continued to change to be more web first, getting stories out as soon as possible. I had our executive editor tell me two days ago not to call, not to talk about the paper anymore. That's how much it's changed. They don't even want to have the language uh, that we used to, used to use all the time. He wants to talk about, you know, um, digital. And uh, our website used to be very much like yours. You know, newspapers were posting stories and they would stay up there all day long and nothing would change. Now we're very interactive. You know, I have a, a, a pretty big presence on Facebook and Twitter, and um, you know, I don't like to tweet as much as I do Facebooking. But um, other people are on Instagram and Snapchat, things like that, at our office. Uh, photographers, particularly, have really large Instagram follow followings, um, and so our website <coughs> has become uh, very speedy. Uh, Old school reporters like me are used to, you know, crafting stories and then having them revised and thinking about them. Now we're just cranking out two paragraphs like you are. And uh, I like sports. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Buckeye stuff. Um, 
you know, we're, we're just cranking it out now all day long. They do push alerts every 15 minutes whether we have anything to say or not. Um, and we're not just pushing breaking news, we're pushing uh, what I think we should be pushing, which is our unique content. Uh, you know, things that we've created ourselves that you can't get anywhere else. Um, and we're finding that the home page really isn't even much of a concern anymore because I think home pages are eventually going to disappear. It's a thousand points of light. You know, you just scatter your content all over the place and people come in through referrals and news feeds and things like that. So. We've become extremely uh, web-centric. Um, Gannett, you know, for good or bad, is uh, is moving away very rapidly from the print model. So, although our Sunday paper is still very large as well, it's still in the top ten. Uh, so we have been doing pretty well on the web and with the Sunday paper. It's the daily papers that uh, probably are going to go bye-bye pretty soon. I think. And I was going to ask, um, the Free Press still does a lot of long-form content. How has that long-form content been? Uh, we have to use a Gannett template that they use at their 100 other newspapers around the country and it's formatted so that advertising can be sold on a national basis and they can just be plugged in to different websites. So if you see any Gannett outlet, the websites all look exactly the same. The content's different, but the website structure is the same. Um, and in that template they have uh, other templates for things like long-form journalism. Uh, you know, if you have a really lengthy narrative, you can put it in this long setup they have where videos and, and stills are, you know, laced within the, the body copy, things like that, other things. So it's, it's still a very changing environment. Um, we haven't used everything that is available to us yet, from what I understand. Um, but every day it's something new. Every day. Rachel, you have a really, really broad range of experience. I mean, <laughs> from sports reporting to just looking at some of your more recent pieces uh, with Slate. I mean, you're doing science, you're doing politics, uh, you're on the Slatist, doing the uh, double X factor blog. Um, and you're seeing these think pieces re recently that are kind of like, is there a death of the expertise reporter? Are we losing beats and moving more towards stabs? Um, how do you kind of feel the direction is going with expertise reporters? Um, well, as we've gotten bigger, we've definitely hired a lot of expertise reporters. You know, we used to have, you know, one business writer, and now we have, like, a business columnist and, you know, somebody who primarily blogs. Um, and we do have, um, you know, we have, you know, our, our political staff, but, you know, I think, I mean, obviously you need the expertise. We, you know, we try very hard to get an authority on things and want people to trust us, but also some of like our, our most, you know, like some of our best um, best stories have come from people like straying off their beat. Um, John Dickerson writes for us, he's the host at Face the Nation, um, and he's a great, you know, you know, he's very, he takes his political work very seriously, he doesn't, you know, he works really hard to not be biased, he's just very analytical, um, but some of his best pieces have been when he writes about his kids. And they're just great pieces. Like he wrote one about um, basically after the 2012 election, he had to he was on the road for a year, so we basically had to get home, come back, and get to know his kids again. Um, he's written about them going to camp. Um, Dolly Lithwick is our senior court, or I'm sorry, our Supreme Court writer, and she has done um, like she's one of the like the leading you know writers on the Constitution and the Supreme Court in the whole country. Um, and like last uh, over the spring, she she was under like in bed for two months because she threw out her back and it was terrible. Um, and she wrote a story about like, yeah, again, like how her kid had, her 11 year old son had to learn how to cook and clean the house and how she struggled with that and stuff. Um, so I think, I mean, you know, any serious publication is going to have an abundance of expertise, mm -hmm. uh, abundance of experts. But you also, I mean, it can be helpful to their creative process and good for your publication if, if they branch out once in a while. And I mean, there are a lot of sports reporters in this room right now, and that's kind of the background that you had. I mean, should our sports reporters be getting knowledge in political reporting and business reporting? How much do we really need to know to hit the ground running as a journalist? Um, well, if you're going to be a sports writer, I would definitely take a few business classes. Um, I don't think I took very many business classes when I was here, but um, I mean, even, I mean, there's there's business aspects that come up with high school sports, you know, and like athletic department budgets. Um, certainly in college, certainly in um, certainly in, um, in 
professional leagues. But what I would say is, like, if you're a student, you know, take as many classes as you can. Cause, yeah, I was always going to be a sports writer. That was, I, you know, I, I got to Athens, I hit the ground running. I, you know, back then you really couldn't start the post until you were a sophomore because they only did hiring, like, in the spring of the next year. So, you know, I got on the sports staff as soon as I could, and that was, like, my only focus. And then in 2000, when I lost my job at, um, at Disney.go.com, um, you know, I, I was laid off for six months. I mean, I had like a, a short stint doing um, some stuff for um, the Olympics.com, but you know, I didn't really have a choice. I was like getting ready to like go apply to Pottery Barn just so I could get a discount and say I had a part time job. <laughs> um, but Slate called and Slate didn't need a sports writer. You know, they they needed a copy editor. So I would just <coughs> this is the time of your life to get as a background in as many things as you can. Um, you know, maybe you want to be a sports writer, but you're you're local newspaper, you can get a summer internship there writing business stories. Just do it if you can because someday you're going to have to be flexible. So. And do you feel like writing such a wide variety of content for Slate makes you a better editor? I mean, if you're doing science stuff and political stuff? Um, well, Slate's pretty, like I said, they're pretty indulgent about let people, letting people um, do what they want. But yeah, I mean, because I'm not really, like, so my, um, one of my, like, hobby interests is uh, like paleoanthropology, paleontology, and our science editor knows that because she's talked to me about it before. And so a few months, or I guess it's been like probably a month and a half ago now, she got an email from uh, the scientists at the University of Wisconsin who were like the, um, they were like the, the Americans who worked on the Homo naledi discovery, and they offered her like all the embargoed information. And she's like, I, I don't have time to write this, but I have somebody who's like kind of nerd about this. So I, yeah, so I got to write that. But it is interesting to, yeah, to, like, I'm not an expert on hominids. I had to do a lot of research to like write that story coherently. And, um, but it does because like when I'm writing about something I don't know about, then I see how she's editing it. Like how, you know, I had to go through an editing process that, you know, kind of like I was a little kid and I was, you know, getting edited. Um, so yeah, that term does make you a better editor because it just makes you think differently. And it makes you ask, you know, the biggest thing about editing is really asking, you know, you, you get a piece and, and you have to, you're reading and you have to ask yourself the questions, like what, what's not being answered here? What else do I want to know? What, what is the story not telling me? Um, so yeah, to, to kind of step out of your comfort zone really does, I think, help make you a better writer. And uh, Jim, you're doing weekly columns for the Free Press that are published every Sunday. Uh, you can read his most recent one today, um, called Five Minutes With, and you're arguably spending a lot more than five minutes with a, a lot of curious people around Detroit, um, really great human interest pieces. Can you tell me a little bit more about why you got involved in that and kind of, kind of how that differs from the <coughs> work and data work that you've done? Guess what today's column is. I interviewed a guy who found a woolly mammoth on his property. Oh, I read about that. I think that, that was in the slate display. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually a Jeffersonian movie that some readers have uh, corrected me on. But uh, the column is called um, A Few Minutes With, and it is a Q&A every week. Um, I started doing it, I don't even remember, it's like 10 or 12 years ago, um, because it was a release for me because I do a lot of, was doing more than I am now, a lot of heavy investigative reporting. And while I like that, I also have a quirky side that likes to do writing and investigative pieces, you know, you don't get to write that much. You're mainly reporting and then at the end you go through a flurry of writing to try to, you know, get it in for the weekend. Um, but this is what I like to do. I mean, I, these interviews are stories about people, you know, like, I, anything you can think of I've done in, in the 10 to 12 years. Somebody was asking me if I've done any Halloween ones the other day and I said yeah I did a haunted house on the west side of the state and a woman who lives there and I asked her why she wanted to do it and they said well you're know, struggling to come up with ideas now so I, I usually go off the news and the guy found a woolly mammoth I'm like I'm gonna go interview that dude. <laughs> um, and so I spent the day with him last Friday the morning and I did a video you know my column runs with a video every week that I shoot and edit myself it's very low quality shot with an iPhone but that's the way the world is today um, you guys probably do that in your classes I had to learn it on the job but I do it because it's a release for me. Um, I got to interview a, you know, a very well-respected heart surgeon and got to ask him questions that people would want to ask but aren't rude enough to ask, like, 
what do you feel like when somebody dies in your hands? You know, I mean, and, and do you feel like God sometimes when you're saving lives? And, you know, these are questions I wouldn't even ask as a personal person talking to this guy, but I get to go in as this obnoxious reporter and really ask questions everybody wants to know. So I try to think, um, what is it about this particular person that people always think about, but they never are rude enough to ask? And that's what I like the column to be. So it's a nice side thing for me. Some people think I spend too much time on it, because I like it. But I do. And how do you find those story ideas? Um, if I get in a jam, it's due every Thursday evening. Um, I will panic on Thursday morning, start Googling people until I can figure out somebody <laughs> to go interview. Um, but they're so weird, like, you know, find a heart surgeon, find a dentist, and ask him or her what, what it's like to drill down into somebody's tooth, knowing you might hit a nerve and, you know, send them flying out of the chair. So that it's very wide ranging. But I usually, I used to come up with the ideas mainly myself, but now that people are used to reading it, they suggest them. I get suggestions every week from readers, and they love it when I, when I do one of their suggestions. So, and I'll, you know, pimp it out on <coughs> Facebook and say thanks to so-and-so for the idea and that kind of thing. My wife comes up with a lot of them. She came up with the woolly mammoth, not me. Um, so she's been very good about that, about helping me out. So have some other folks. And Rachel, uh, Slate really puts an emphasis on multimedia reporting. Um, you guys were the first to start doing podcasts, which have been really successful. How does that multifaceted storytelling approach kind of drive Slate? I mean, do you have to think of a lot of different ways to tell a story when you start pitching? Um, we do. We have that. We just had a conversation. Like, I'm, I'm, we're trying to put together a park, a package for the national parks for. Um, next year, because it's the 100th anniversary of the, the Park Service, and again, our science editor who lets me write about um, well, the people, um, uh, is she's also into the park. So we were we went through like the list of stories we have, and we're like, is that better as a video, or is it better as a as a story? And sometimes the answer is that it's better as a story. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's we always try to. If, if we're doing a bigger, like a longer form reporting, um, we call it. We have um, stories that run, well, as they get done, probably about once a month. Um, we call them frescas. It's a long, weird story. Our previous <laughs> editor loved Fresca, and when he became editor, he announced the Fresca Fellowship was you could take a month off your regular beat and go write a, a story that you want, you know, that you're interested in. Um, and we've had lots of like we've had lots of investigative stuff. Um, we just looked at um, somebody who was like wrongfully convicted of arson and how his trial played out. Um, we did a big deep dive. One of our um, one of our more versatile writers who writes on politics and science and stuff, William, William Salatin, he did a big thing on the safety of GMOs. Um, so we, we call those frescas. And pretty much if, if you get assigned to do a fresca, if you get your assignment, there's going to have to be some kind. It's either going to have to have lots of images or it's going to have to be an interactive. I mean, we're, we're asking readers to invest a lot of time into these stories, and so we want to give them something. Um, in the podcast, it kind of grew organically. Now it's its own. We have like a whole side business called Panoply um, for our podcasting network, and we're we have our we have our Slate podcasts, but then uh, we offer like a suite of services to other um, publications. Like we'll help them sell their advertising, or we'll help we'll give them producers and you know and studio time and stuff like that. Um, that grew rather organic, but we had to start with the political gap fest, and then there's the culture gap fest, the double X gap fest. Um, and it's like um, one of the coolest things, I, I still think one of my favorite things on site is something that never is on site, it's the gist. And we hired Mike Pesca away from NPR, and he does a daily podcast. And it's about the news of the day. He's got like a few recurring segments. Um, he brings on people from NPR and other, and the New Yorker and stuff to talk. Um, but you know, sometimes he talks about the news. Sometimes he talks about, um, you know, uh, culture <coughs> stuff. He'll do business stuff. He had on, you know, he had on some guy who was a bus an American businessman living in Russia, and basically like Putin came <coughs> in and like took all of his like, like he was an investor. He was doing hedge funds in, in Russia and took like five hundred million dollars from him. And this guy like had to flee. He had to get out of Russia before like Putin killed him and his family. So um, it's just this wide-ranging show, and it's it's one of my favorite things on Slate. And it's not even a, a story; um, it's a podcast. So um, yeah, I mean, we just it's 
we we come up with like many I we come up with like ideas for like just short run podcasts all the time. I mean serial kind of set the um set the room people like, oh you can do something for like six episodes. It doesn't have to be something that happens every week or every month. Um so we've you know, we've tried to um you know, we've tried to really develop the podcasts and they're they're doing really well. So so as a good reporter and now also a good videographer, somebody that can get up, do podcasts, shoot their own photos, I mean, when you guys are hiring writers, are you also looking to make sure that they have those skills as well? Um, those are always a nice benefit. Uh, you know, we wouldn't hire somebody just, you know, we wouldn't hire a less talented writer just because they could also take photographs or shoot video. Um, but for the people who can do that, it's, it's fantastic. Um, we just had um, Jamal Bowie, who's one of our senior political writer. He just did a big thing comparing Donald Trump to um, oh, the crazy guy from George Wallace. <laughs> the other crazy guy who ran for president 50 years ago. Um, and Jamal took all of his own photographs, and he's really good. So there was a whole this this a gallery of like these really powerful like <coughs> shots from a Donald Trump rally, and he did those himself. So um, I would say. Like, Learn as much as you can. Yes, um, like I'm a terrible photographer. Um, actually, wrote about that for Slate recently about how terrible a photographer I am. Um, so yeah, learn the skills because you just never know what you're going to be called on to do. And if you can, it, it's it's definitely helps you. So you still have to be a talented reporter and writer though. You can't you can't make up for you know that skill that those lack of skills if just because you can take pictures. And uh, Jim, a lot of your reporting too centers on multimedia, includes a multimedia element. Um, recently, you spent a week on a freighter, traveling around the Great Lakes. Um, if you're from Michigan, freighters are like mystical and beautiful, and you always are wondering where they're going and what they're doing, and you turn that into a story. Um, and went out with Eric Seals, and it was a lot of different elements. It was the multimedia element, the videos, a story that was updated every day, and then in the end, a really, really cool long-form package. Um, would encourage everybody to check it out. It's really cool. Um, how did that story come to be, and how did it come to involve so many elements? Um, Eric and I wanted to go on vacation for a week and get the paper to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we had, uh, you know, ever since I've been at the Free Press, one big um, gap in our coverage has been the Great Lakes. We don't write enough about it. And um, I thought it was one of these topics, uh, after conferring with Eric, who actually started on it before I did, that people would go crazy over. And uh, this is one of those packages that fortunately gets great traffic, but also is worth doing because it's good journalistically, right? It's not just clickbait. So um, we had done a story together last fall about this woman who lives on Harsons Island, which is an island in Lake St. Clair, um, sort of northeast of Detroit. <clears throat> and uh, whenever freighters, you know, these thousand foot monsters go by her home, which is on the shore, they will toot their air horn, like long blasts, loud, shakes the whole island. And uh, they do it because she's, the, She's always been called the flower lady. She owns a flower shop in Detroit, and for decades she's been sending bouquets to these ships. And so we did this story last fall where we found out how this relationship started, and it goes back to an uncle she had who had Alzheimer's, who used to work on a ship, and he retired but got sick, and so she was living with him, and she'd wheel him out to the bank on her, on her back porch every day, and he'd wave at the ships, and they would just go by without acknowledging it. And so she wrote this really emotional letter to every Great Lakes ship captain, like 80 of them, and said, hey, when you go by mile marker so-and-so in the St. Clair River, there's an old engineer sitting out there waving at you, and it would be so cool if you guys would acknowledge him. And so they started coming by and blasting their horn. And so to thank her, or to thank them, she would start sending them flowers. So they developed this symbiotic relationship that goes back really to the late 80s, I believe. And uh, so we did that story. And it, and it was very well received. So we thought, you know, I always wondered about freighters, never been on one. Um, I knew we could make it multimedia. We also periscoped the hell out of it. We did like 25 periscopes from the deck of this freighter. Um, and we went all the way from Detroit through Lake Huron, through the Sioux Locks, all the way across Lake Superior to Duluth, Minnesota, where they picked up 70,000 tons of coal 
and then all the way back again. So it was six and a half days. Um, and it was just so colorful and all the, we, we just, it was like, it was a great assignment because you can be hyper-focused. So you can do all this stuff like tweeting and, you know, writing blogs and periscoping and we were also writing print stories that would come out, you know, in the morning newspaper. Um, because that's all we had to do. We were just living that for a week. And, you know, you can sort of immerse yourself in it. And I think it came through in our coverage because we weren't running around doing a million other things. You know, that's one great thing that when you're committed to a multimedia project, really commit to it and don't just tweet it out. You know, there's so many other things you can do, like using all the other technology. Periscope, Eric went crazy on Instagram. I was all over Facebook and Twitter. And um, I picked up like 500 Twitter followers in, uh, in four or five days. So it was, it was definitely worth it. Um, we're going to try to do it again in December with a different ship that delivers, uh, it's a Coast Guard ship actually, that delivers Christmas trees to poor people in Chicago, Michigan Christmas trees to Chicago, but it's not confirmed yet, so don't hold me to it, but that's how that came about. I mean, with everything being so web-centric and getting stories up as soon as you can and everything's about breaking news, do you think that people are slowing down the reporters or slowing down the freighter for a week? I think the younger reporters are struggling with that, frankly, because they've never done it the old way. Um, and I don't want to sound crotchety and, uh, <laughs> and too old school, but um, I have the advantage of knowing how to tell a good story because I had to do it the old way with just a pen and a, and a pad and listen to people's quotes and find out what was important. Some of the younger folks who, who are very talented, um, uh, there's one story where somebody went to a court hearing and they were tweeting out uh, what was happening and just completely missed like the killer quote. And I was sad for him because he just didn't know any better, you know? Um, sometimes you just gotta put it down. You can do lots of things at once, but you also have to listen. And I think that's tough for some of the younger reporters that are coming in because they're being asked to do so many different things. I mean, I have the advantage, I know how to do all this stuff, but I can kind of play dumb with some editors and they'll, you know, because I'm like 51, so they'll think, oh, he doesn't know how to do that. Um, so I can, you know, take notes longer than a, than a kid can, but, um, and get away with it. Uh, but, you know, I, th I think uh, the kids coming out of the schools right now are way proficient. Um, at using all this multimedia technology. They just need to also learn how to tell stories and then they'll be kicking my butt every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is a question I have for you both, but Rachel, um, obviously everybody in their reporting career has mistakes and corrections and things that they could have done better but they learned from. Um, is there one particular correction or mistake you can identify in your early reporting career that really taught you a lot and sits in the back of your mind now? No, justice. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many of them, I don't even remember. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, I would have to say, I guess this, was, this wasn't even that, um, this, this wasn't even early. We had a, so Slate and other publications do this too. We have editorial partnerships with like smaller sites um, or content swaps. And one thing we do is we run, um, you know, we run um, posts from Quora. Does anybody read Quora? Um, it's like a question and answer site. Like you can, people will ask like historical questions or opinion questions, and then like anybody can answer them, and then the, the best answers get voted up. It's supposed to be some. It's all user generated content and sharing and stuff like that. But sometimes they have like really like encyclopedic knowledge of like Game of Thrones or. Um, like Hunter Games in different different entertainment things and different science questions. So we've long had a, a partnership with them, and um, we so we like Quora like sends us posts and then we put them in our system and publish them on Slate and then they get a leak back and they get free attention and we get free content. And we had one that um, it, you know they had uploaded this post and I just published it right. I didn't read it well enough and it was a it was a woman wrote. I, I don't forget what the original question was, but her answer was just this long, like, 800-word post on how she was treated unfairly by her doctor because she was overweight. Well, there was, like, no way to prove that. It was her account. And, like, it's funny because I had just had a meeting with my editor, and she was like, yeah, we, we need more core. Make sure you're getting up, like, five or six things a week. And so I was in a hurry, and, like, we got all kinds of comments, and we pretty much had to take it down. 
and um, this was probably two years ago. And you know, I was embarrassed because it was just it was a complete lapse of judgment. Um, and it comes with you know the pace. You know, there's demands to be fast and demands to to get stuff off and out. And so you know, again, it just comes to like start like, part of being an editor. The biggest thing you do as an editor is not just rewrite people's sentences. It's to ask the questions that aren't being answered in the, in the story. And I just, you know, I had published and then we were embarrassed for a day. And yeah, like somebody, like a trade publication, like a media newsletter wrote about it and said how bad, you know, it was bringing Slate's, you know, brand down to run bad content from Laura. And so it was yeah, not my happiest Friday afternoon. <laughs> And obviously, uh, corrections teach you a lot. Um, what did that correction particularly teach you? To slow down. Yeah. I mean, and uh, you know, like make sure that when we were running posts from Quora, that they not be like someone's first person account. You know, like or, or just like a make it a question about a, a, a you know science experiment or a new story or yeah you know, something like that. Don't make it about a, a memoir. Jim. Um, I think everybody makes mistakes. It's how you respond to them that goes to your uh, credibility and your integrity in this business. I think there's a lot of erasing of electronic stuff and replacing it and thinking nobody saw it going on these days, which is a bad thing in my opinion. I think if you correct something, you should note on the story that this has been corrected. Um, we, do that, we do things like that all the time. There's no set policy yet on how you're supposed to handle internet corrections, at least in my company. Um, I've been very, very, very fortunate to never make a catastrophic mistake in print. And I think it's because there's so many safeguards in place. Come really close. I mean, I've had stories where, um, you know, we've gone in after the page has been sent to the printing press back in the old days and had to fix something at the last second. <clears throat> but now that we're reporting faster, I made a mistake last week. I, uh, I was off and I was retweeting uh, a story that we had and it was about uh, a uh, Monica Conyers divorcing filing to divorce John Conyers who was a very well-respected congressman from Michigan longest serving uh, representative in Congress and uh, in the tweet I put Monica Conyers divorcing former US rep John Conyers I don't know why I, I, as soon as I saw it I knew it wasn't right but it was already tweeted so I deleted it, but then I sent another tweet saying, hey, I fixed, I fixed the previous tweet I took out former, because he's, he's still working. Uh, <laughs> so I think the speed of how we report now makes things um, much shakier, and, and we all need to step back and take a breath and read what we're about to send out there, because it's too easy to slip up. And uh, Rachel, I wanted to ask you, particularly as a woman, um, is there any advice that you have in here for the female journalists in the room or any experiences that you've had as a journalist that you feel are particular to you being a woman? Um, I've always had, I, I haven't had any too many unpleasant experiences. Um, now when I was a sports writer, um, like the worst part of going into a, a locker room actually was not going into the locker room, it was like the groupies outside that were throwing you dirty looks and like, why does she get to go in the locker room? Um, I didn't really have too many unfortunate experiences like that. Um, I would say, uh, this is kind of like a, a personal axe to guard. I think that there are a lot of women, um, women journalists who are like pigeonholing them by writing so much about gender. You know, like, it's, it's an important topic. We need to debate it. I mean, you know, like Jezebel and our blog, you know, they, they all have their purpose, but uh, to me, it's almost like you know, like 20 or 30 years ago, like all female doctors were getting kind of shunted into OBGYN, and like there's other things that, which is great. It's good to have female OBGYNs, but just I would say you know report about a lot of things. If you want to write about gender, it's a worthwhile beat, but don't necessarily you know just there's a, women should be business writers and science writers and political writers, and they are. But I've just noticed like lately, like with you know, the, the first person internet. We just had a funny, a really long essay about the, like, the dangers of sharing too much on the internet. Um, and I think women writers are more prone to doing that because there are so many, you know, like, 
there are so many things that we're still trying to overcome is women, but we're kind of like so focused on like the gender beat right now that I think that women are just missing opportunities to tell other stories from a women's point of view. So, um, but I mean, I would say that Slate is probably, it's definitely, well I was in sports before where I was always like one of the only women, but um, I mean, we don't have a lot, the like, Slate's very equitable. What I'm trying to say, um, you know, like our we have a woman editor, um, and that was she's one of the only, you know there aren't a lot of female editors at magazines anywhere in the country. Um, though Salon does too, weirdly enough, at the same time. Um, so there's we don't pigeonhole anybody into beats. I mean, yes, the women who choose to write about gender are choosing to do that, but we have men that write on gender for us, um, and we have women writing about everything. So. Um, it's actually been really hard for us to hire women to cover politics. They get hired away. Like we've had a few, and they get hired away by, you know, deeper pocketed publications really fast. So that kind of proves my point. There's a there's a need for women to be covering politics um, and stuff. And so it's it's very it, it's not even an issue. I don't think. I mean, maybe if I was in the office, I'd see it differently. But to me, it's like everybody writes what they know about. So it doesn't matter who you are. And. Jim, you've stayed in Detroit forever, um, and right now kind of the mantra is that you have to be moving from city to city and publication to publication and don't stay anywhere for too long because you should be, you should be getting as diverse as an experience as you can. Um, can you speak a little bit to why you have stayed in Detroit for so long and why you like reporting there? Because it's the best news town in America. <laughs> it really is. I, uh, I'm not from Detroit. I, uh, thanks to my good friend Justice Hill up there, I. Uh, I got an internship at the Free Press when I was at Ohio State and ended up being a job a year later. Um, lived with Justice for about six months. I don't recommend that to any of you. <laughs> but, I had a uh, nice place, man. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't I still owe you money or something? Probably. <laughs> uh, but I was going to be there for five years, and uh, I started covering the police at night in the city, and I saw things that I had never seen before, um, and I just it just stuck with me. I mean, it's a place that really needs journalists, um, and I'm still there uh, for many reasons, but one of the big reasons is because um, I feel like I'm doing uh, what we all get into journalism to do there. Uh, which is give a voice to people who don't have a voice and write about problems and hopefully uh, get somebody to fix them. Um, and it sounds cliched and cheesy and sappy, but it, you really can do that in journalism. And Detroit needs way more journalists than they have right now. So um, I never really pursued anywhere else. And I went on TV for a little while and that was cool. Um, but I got a great job back at, at the Free Press. I mean, I may have to look for a job sometime in the future with the way the job cuts are going and things like that. But um, it's I love working there and I have a great job. Uh, luckily, we're in a room full of journalists, so I'm assuming there are some other questions to be had. Um, Will, is there any particular way you'd like to handle people asking questions? Do we want to form a line, have people to stand up and introduce themselves? Unless there's a lot of, like, unless every one of you wants to ask a question, I think hands is fine if that works for you guys. Yeah. Cool. All right. If, and Emma, if, since we're uh, recording this, if you wouldn't mind kind of restating each one, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, awesome. certainly. Um, so, once we put in the hot seat, go first. Uh, Miss Emily Bohatch. Hi, I, yeah. I'm Emily Bohatch. I work at the Post. Um, so, my question is when you have news that's breaking, especially when you're at an online first publication, how do you handle that? Do you put the first release online and then add more to the same story? Do you do multiple stories? How do you guys typically handle those situations? Uh, we've done it in different ways. Oh, and, and the question is according as to how to handle breaking news in an online only situation, or online first situation. Um, we, we've done different things. It kind of depends on the story. So um, when you have like a, like a mass shooting event, we'll go immediately to our news blog and get the news out as it happens. Um, and we'll have like one post that is just the breaking news that is updated constantly. Um, and that buys us time to have the, the more deeply reported stories go up like through, or, you know, uh, maybe two or three hours later or the next day. Um, 
if something, if there's a story that happens and there's like some weird new development that's apart from, you know, the, the actual breaking news, we might break out a separate post. Uh, but the idea is to have, you know, the, the news blog goes up first, information as we have it. Um, we update, we don't like do strike through or anything like that. Um, so as like information changes, we don't delete what's, um, what's been put there before. We'll acknowledge, because I know like with the, the shooting in Oregon a couple weeks ago, um, there was, the New York Times really early jumped on the religion angle, like the rumor that the shooter was asking people if they were a Christian. And then they took their story down and we had linked to that. So what we did was we, we left it all in there and said the New York Times took their story down and that we didn't know anything yet. Um, and so and then that would be like the first day. And then like the next day we'd like start a new post with more. And then we'd backfill with our reported stories and our analysis and stuff by your more senior writers. And we would do it in a similar way, except we don't do a blog. We would start tweeting it and then the reporters at the scene would tweet and the paper would retweet them and maybe aggregate them all onto our website in a Storify or whatever program they're using these days to do that. And then uh, somebody on the web desk, which they call the hub, would probably write a paragraph or two unless somebody's dictating from the street or with a laptop or just doing it on their iPhone. And then, uh, you know, we would append to it as the story goes. We would keep promoting, you know, come back to freep.com for more information as we get it, that kind of thing. So a lot of promotion, a lot of quick bursts of information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we periscope. Um, several reporters are doing that from the paper there. Yeah. Um, my name is Max McDoolin, and uh, I was just curious, You, um, Rachel, you brought up page views and, and clicks. Uh, and uh, and then Jim, you brought up you know trying to to spread out your content and, and reach a broad audience um, in a landscape that's so driven by the digital world. Um, what have you guys done to try and and continue to create stories that have good content while still driving people to go and read the story? Because I feel like sometimes we're so focused here at, at WUB in a meeting, we'll bring a hey, pat on back to this guy, he got 2,500 page views. But we don't always bring up, hey, great story. You know, it's more about the clicks than it's about the story. So what do you guys do to make sure you're still bringing great content and being good storytellers? Um, well, obviously we've developed a lot of blogs, like our news blog and our culture blog, and that allows us to kind of go chase the traffic while other people are doing reported pieces or feature stories um, and longer pieces. Um, and then and we, we get everything out there. We have a whole team, in terms of like getting readers um, eyeballs on the good stories, um, we have a whole staff of people who that's their job. We have two traffic editors, um, like with social media type editors. And then a, like we have somebody with a senior editor level position who's our audience engagement. And they spend their days like maintaining like like learning what the new trends are on Facebook and how the algorithms working and studying like doing A/B testing to see like what headlines work better on Twitter um, we have services that we use that push our stories out at a given time um, just to make sure we're front of everybody so, um, so it's kind of two-pronged um, sorry that's my phone that's way over there um, <laughs> Yeah, so we, we do we have like the, the quick bursts of news that go out first that buy people time. That's like our editorial mission. And then we use our audience engagement people to get eyeballs on things. So I hope that um, It can be very discouraging, frankly. And I think we're losing the battle. Um, when somebody at my paper uh, two days ago complained that the local content was being overshadowed by the black whopper that turns your poop green. <laughs> um, that can make that can make you feel like why what am I doing yeah what are we doing but to me you do that at great risk to your publication or whatever you work for because once you start selling out and just aggregating whatever gets hits um, the temptation is to do that more and more often so what happens is we have people who complain about it in our newsroom and we pull them back from the brink a little bit 
I like the Black Whopper story. I, uh, I posted it on my fa Facebook page, you know, first thing in the morning when I saw it, because it was written by an Indie Star reporter. It was well written. It was a nice little narrative. I don't know if you guys have seen that version of the Black Whopper turning to poop green story, but go, uh, go on freak.com and check it out. It was a well done story. So in that particular instance, I think people complaining about it were wrong. But Kim Kardashian stuff and you know whatever's going on with other celebrities is very disheartening to see get better play. Um, when we complain as reporters, sometimes we're told you need to get over this where things are played on our website mentality because ha only half of our readers are seeing the website. It's where you are everywhere else on <coughs> social that draws the, the viewers and so you shouldn't worry about it so much. Still, when you're looking at it, because that's your default page, it kind of kind of hurts. But um, we have discussions all the time. That's how we keep trying to make us, you know, make our own original content, um, get the get the play that it deserves, and you know, um, you have to fight back from that urge to just throw clickbait out there. If you don't, if you're not highlighting your original content, I think you're uh, you're losing you're going to lose eventually, because anybody can be an aggregator. Thank you. Um, Blue? Uh, I'm Luke O'Rourke. I'm a sports reporter for The Post. Uh, my question for both of you guys is, um, as an aspiring sports reporter, what should I be looking out for, and what are ways I can diversify my storytelling? So uh, the question was, how, as a sports reporter, do you diversify your content, and what should you be preparing for if you want to get into the field of sports sports? Good question. Um, not sports for so long. Um, I mean, just, I, I don't know, the simplest answer is just to, to keep writing. <laughs> um, write a lot. Um, I mean, no, be willing, you know, figure out how cross country works and how volleyball works. Um, be prepared to, you know, if you're working in a small paper, you're going to have to write up the city swim meet sometime. So, you know, it's um, it's not just about, you know, covering the NBA and the NFL and Major League Baseball. Um, so, yeah, I would, I mean, you can do enterprise reporting on, like, what new sports, like, lacrosse is, like, where I live in Cincinnati, lacrosse has, like, taken off in the last five years. Like, you know, nobody played it five years ago, now pretty much everybody does. Um, so, yeah, I would just, you know, keep your eyes open and, you know, learn about all the sports that you might not think are really cool right now. Um, I think it's the same advice I would give people who are getting, who want to be regular news reporters and writers, which is, Resist the temptation to write first-person columns about everything that you see. Because all students like to do that. I teach at two universities as an adjunct, and the hardest thing for me to get across to these guys is, you need to learn how to master third-person storytelling before you can jump into this first-person stuff. The first-person stuff is very difficult, and it should be a reward for after you've done years of really good game stories and really good news stories. You've got to learn how to do those very fundamental writing uh, exercises before you can start blogging um, effectively, I mean. Everybody can write a column. Um, this is why I think this is important, but to really distinguish yourself, you got to be a good, good writer of stories and game stories or enterprise stories. Um, the real primo job in sports is to be a columnist. And I can see why. It's a great gig. You get to go around and tell everybody what you think. But to get that, you don't start there. <laughs> you have to learn how to do that other stuff first. Thank you. Uh, yes? Uh, my name is Jack Zink. Uh, a, couple, a couple weeks ago, uh, Chris Broussard tweeted out um, about Tristan Thompson signing a deal. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's pretty much the biggest story of the summer in Northeast Ohio in the NBA. But anyways, he tweeted out that he did sign. Uh, it was a big people were tweeting about it, talking about it, and then he, a couple of tweets later he said, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, he's willing to sign. Uh, in today's era, um, when writing a tweet, do you almost have to edit it and proofread it like you're um, writing like a regular story because of the power that Twitter has? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can you can cause real problems with that, <laughs> saying that you're interested in Tom is going to sign it. You know, when you're an authority like is it, I mean, it, 
the more followers you have, really, the, the more important it is to, to edit. And we were actually just having a conversation about this internally at Slate, like the ethics of like deleting a tweet. Um, for, I mean, for most people, you know, if, who aren't journalists, it doesn't matter if you delete a tweet, but if you're tweeting, even in an unofficial capacity, I mean, everybody, you know, everybody's Twitter bio says, you know, tweets are my own opinion, but you're also at the same time representing your publication, especially if you're well known. And so you could, yeah, if you're, if you're using Twitter to further your work or to do, to share your reporting, then it needs to be, yeah, responsible delete it but somebody's already retweeted it and captured it because they love you know people like it when journalists make mistakes especially if you have a lot of followers so you should always assume that your tweet has been seen and correct it rather I mean you can delete it I deleted the one I did two weeks ago but I sent out another tweet that said I fixed this earlier tweet that had bad info in it um, so yeah, you gotta be really careful. And it's so tempting to just send it out there, especially, you know, and we tweet it all hours, right? You're not uh, asleep, or I mean, you're not at work sitting at your desk thinking as you would while you're at work. It's sitting on the couch watching TV and doing five other, five other things at the same time. So you have to be really, really cautious. Definitely. Uh, well. Um, this is fairly basic, but you guys have talked about all these different kinds of storytelling and all the things your publications are doing. Um, but to everyone in this room, why do we need to care deeply still about being good writers? Um, and I don't know, what, what one or two specific points of advice might you have on, on that, if that makes sense? <laughs> <laughs> because to me, um, good writing leads to good tweets and good Facebook posts and all that other stuff. Um, good writing helps you develop an ear for good quotes. Um, an adherence to accuracy, um, a certain rhythm in the way that words are put together, and uh, the ability to rewrite and edit yourself. I mean, everybody needs an editor, but you should be able to rewrite your own stuff as well. And um, in this era, you know, my company calls it publication-ready content, which I think is ridiculous because nobody writes publication-ready content, but we're being asked to do that. I mean, literally, sometimes we throw stuff on the web and then edit it, which is scary. Um, but that's the way it's, it's working in, the, in this day and age. Um, but to me, I just think if you can become a good writer, all that other stuff is so much easier. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. But. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of evolution. I've seen the, the media evolve. You know, we used to worry that, oh, what happens when newspapers go away? Well, I mean, there's always going to be news. There's always going to be journalism. And everything that has, everything that's come along in the last 10 years should be seen as something that adds to your very good reporting, your very good writing. You know, like, like video components should be, should be adding to, they should not be replacing. Um, interactive would be a better way to illustrate the good story you've just written. I mean, just because things are evolving, it doesn't mean they're replacing. Like, Twitter should not replace journalism. It, it, yes, it's, it is, it's important, it's very, it has changed the way people are reporting. People become famous for like tweeting out the news before they're writing their own story. Um, but at the end of the day, that story has to be there, otherwise, I mean, our business won't succeed. People have to give them something to read. It can't all be, you know, a video clip in two paragraphs or a story find twi Twitter list. You know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just essential. The other thing you need to do is read. Um, my kids, I have the hardest time getting them to put down that iPad and read. Even books are supposed to be reading for school. It's just like their brain doesn't work like that anymore. To sit there and just read something for an hour. When's the last time anybody in here did that? All of you. Wow, I'm impressed. Um, that is a real skill that helps with writing. You have to read good writers. That's how you really can pick up how words sound, the, the rhythm of certain great, great, uh, greatly crafted sentences. You got to read really good writers. That's how you learn. And I don't think enough of that's going on anymore. I don't even have time to read anymore. Got my phone in my lap. <laughs> Thank you. Um, over there. 
Uh, my name is Sam. I'm a former postie and I work for the Athens News. So I, you both kind of just stole my question. Um, so I was going to ask, uh, you know, I didn't really learn storytelling in this school until I had Justice's feature reporting class. Um, so in feature writing, we did a lot of, of storytelling, but I mean, I would not have learned storytelling until then, and I was a, I was a junior then, and until I got to my you know, my internship at the Athens News, that's when I really focused on being you know a, a reporter out in the community where I could have a few weeks to work on a long you know investigative story. So what would you suggest? Because I, I really this school, unfortunately, I don't think we're teaching enough storytelling. So what would you suggest? Like our places to go aside from reading good writing, like the places to go outside of school to like enhance our own education here. Um, what, what did Justice say? Half a website. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can, if you want to be, if you want to be a, a storyteller, I mean, are you asking like how to get freelance opportunities? Or? I mean, I just, how to bulk up, I mean, I feel like a lot of people who, who go here don't really get the opportunity to bulk up like their, their core storytelling mm -hmm. skills. So just where to reach out for that. Yeah, I mean, I I would say consider stories that you want to write and and do try to pitch them to like smaller publications. Um, or, you know, make your own website and just do the story and put it out there as, as your own work. Um, I mean, there are, like, people use Medium for that kind of thing. Um, I forget how, I've never used Medium, but, yeah, I mean, there are ways to just tell the stories. Um, and obviously, it's kind of, I feel kind of awkward if you're writing stories for no specific publication because you are spending your time and your source's time and stuff, but it, it can't hurt, you know. So does the does the post run longer stories? We do indeed. Okay. Um, but I, I that's what I was getting at earlier. I don't think you guys have enough opportunities to do that, and so you graduate all, with all these multimedia skills. But where do you learn how to put a long story together? Um, I think you need to find mentors like him, and uh, there are there are other, there are others out there. You know, people who are in the business who have done it and can help you. You may not get it at the school, um, who will be glad in their off time to look at the story you've written and give you some suggestions. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to get it at wherever you get a job, and um, you know de that depends on whether they run that kind of thing or not. But find an English professor who can help you uh, with story, with you know narrative construction and things like that, um, and ask them if they'll read something that you wrote. I mean, at either of your publications, would you have, if, if we had somebody with strong multimedia skills, like you, you specifically talked about if somebody has strong multimedia skills and you won't hire them if they, their core storytelling isn't enough. Right. So do you, either of you have like a program or, you know, not program, but like, would you look at someone from a school like this who maybe was a little bit weak and give them a chance to get their route running and sort of develop those skills or would you suggest this is, you know, we can play into the internship? Yeah, it would be, I mean, like I know Slate, Slate specifically, our internships are hugely competitive um, and often go to people from elite schools on the East Coast and I beat my head against the wall. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I try. I really try. Um, but, um, I mean, you definitely need to have, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a weird catch-22 that you, you need to have shown some proficiency. Um, to get an internship, to get the you know uh, the skills that you put yourself in an environment where you, where you learn those skills. Um, so I mean, it's just you know, we're always looking for. I mean, honestly, if you're trying to like get the good internship and stuff, you you really have to sell yourself, and it's not just your clips. It's like the you know it's and not just your resume. It's like how you come across and like your cover letter and just, you know, if you can tell a good story about yourself, then, I mean, if you can't tell a good story about yourself, then, you know, put you <coughs> going to trust you to tell a good story about other people. So, um, I mean, I, yeah, I feel like, I feel like, you know, Justice is built a website. I just say, right, you know, just right. Even if it's not for a publication, you're going to get better. Um, work with your, start a writing group with your friends, you know, your fellow students where, you write, you know, stories, and you just share them with each other and critique them, and that you edit each other. Um, that's gonna. It's just writing's an art, but it's also built. You know, you get better by repetition, just like anything else.
Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Steven Hernandez. I'm a freshman here. I personally focus a bit more on broadcasting, so this is going to be a question uh, revolving more around journalism. Uh, Mr. Sheffer, you said something that was really interesting while answering one of the questions related to Twitter, saying that mm -hmm. the people really like to see journalists fail. And I really like what you said because you, you two are really big people in journalism in general. At the forefront of Slate Magazine, you have your own, Mr. Sheffer, you have your own Wikipedia page. You have. You have. Thanks, Mom. You have a you have a Pulitzer Prize under your name, which is something that I believe everyone here aspires to attain someday. So, and with all the experience and all the stuff you've been through, do you think that the attitude of the people towards journalists has changed, or how do you guys feel with the people around you, and? Has it changed at all once you guys eventually made it to these positions or attained these things that have credibility to them? Um, I think it has changed, and I think it's because we're grouped in with everyone uh, because it's so easy to publish. <coughs> you know, newsp newspapers used to be able to print money because it was very difficult and very expensive for people to get their story out there because they didn't own a printing press. Now, you can do it with a with a keystroke, and there are a million people calling themselves journalists. So um, I think the image of the media has continued to go down, and I do think um, the internet has highly politicized journalism. Um, we're all seeing that those of us in the mainstream media, I and mean, they even have a name for it, mainstream media. That never used to be a, a term until you know '95 or so. Um, and we're all seen as left-wingers, so they're, uh, they're waiting to see a mistake happen. Um, at the same time, I think it makes us more credible, because we are aware of that. Those people who are really striving to protect their reputations and, and the one thing they have, which is credibility. So to me, it's more important than ever to make sure that you're, everything you do is as accurate as you can possibly make it and that you've done all the safeguards that you can possibly take. Now, that said, people still make mistakes. So the other point that I would like to make about that is um, we talk now. Back in the old days, newspaper reporters were almost unreachable. We didn't have our names at the end of story. We had a byline, but we didn't have even phone numbers at the ends of stories. We didn't talk to anybody. By anybody, I mean readers. We would talk to the people we're writing about or, or hear, hear from the subjects of our interviews the next day, but actual regular readers we never heard from. Now they can post right after the end of your story and say what an asshole you are. <laughs> um, and so we're immediately accountable to people. And I like that because I love getting complaints from readers um, because I can always turn them into a loyal reader in the, in the space of a telephone conversation or an email exchange or something because I think a lot of people are still in that old mindset. I'm firing off this angry email or post about somebody and they're just a robot and they're so busy they'll never respond. And they respond and they're like, whoa, there's an actual human being on the other end of this who wrote that story. And so I like that interaction now. And to me, um, it has changed dramatically. It's completely different than it was even 15 years ago. And I think it's good because it makes us strive to protect our reputations even more because there's so many people out there shooting arrows. I think you covered it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, people do want to see us fail, um, but we're, you know, we're visible. I mean, our names are out there, our faces are out there in a way that, you know, we're not famous people to the rest of the world, but, you know, because you're so visible, you know, nobody, like if you work at a, a corporation, you know, you're, if you're in customer service, like, you might have to share a name with somebody, but you're not, you're putting yourself out there, like, so we're in a weird position where we're putting ourselves out there and not asking for it, but it's so visible, and yeah, if you write something that people don't like, or you're, they're, it's like shouting for it, you know, they, mm. they want to, to see you keep up, so. Just, just be careful, you know, always as, as fast as the pace gets, you know, just slow down and think twice. And
question? Yeah, and I think you're trying to wrap up, so I'll make it quick. Um, I'm Jalen Grisso. I'm the digital editor, editor and projects manager for New Political. Um, my question is, because you have both been in the industry for a while and you've seen all the shifts and you've seen how things have changed, what do you, as people that have dealt with this industry for a while, want to see from us? Um, obviously, a lot of professors and things push that we should have the multimedia skills and like, yes, we can have that skill set and add it to our resume, but at the end of the day, when you're getting ready to hire somebody, what do you want to see from that? What, what can we bring to the table as we can move forward? Um, I would say like doggedness. Um, I, from what, to be specific to OU, what I've seen from like the, the graduates who leave from here and are like immediately successful and get the cool big jobs that get them invited back here to talk and stuff. Like, OU students have a great reputation for working, like script students have a great reputation for working hard. Um, you know, so, you know, they're, they're tireless. They will, you know, they will make the extra phone call to, to fact check. They will, um, you know, get a fourth source instead of two or three. Um, they will learn new skills. Um, they will, you know, they will master social media, like, on the fly, because, and that will help them get a job. Um, so it's just, it's really just, just show us that you'll work hard and not ex Expect you know to get promoted and yeah you know, like don't try. did anyone see the Saturday Night Live sketch about millennials? Yes, yes, that drives us old people crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I do like we I do see like a lot of young people I know that that work at like they do they need feedback and they need rewards and you know that that participation type thing. Um, so just come in and work hard and prove yourself through your work. I don't hire anybody, I'm just a rank and file staff writer. Um, but I can tell you what I'd like to see in a colleague, and that is doggedness, um, versatility, perseverance, and um, somebody who has enough self confidence to say, I'm not just chasing web hits. Okay? This is a story we have to do that's very important, whether it gets web hits or not. And lastly, a um, healthy disrespect for the bosses <laughs> or suspicion, either or, either one of those two. Good. All right, guys. Well, I, I just want to say thank you again for coming out. These guys will be down here. Also, Ken Gordon, Mike Merritt, and Dave Scott are here, and they're going to be some of our editors here tomorrow. They'll be down here as well, so feel free to ask questions, introduce yourself. One more round of applause. Thank you.